From the Samira Foundation, this is Demystifying NMO and MOG, where we bring together the world's foremost experts, the doctors dedicated to studying it, and the patients who live with it every day, with support from Genetech. Welcome back for another episode of Demystifying NMO and MOG. We have an excellent episode for you today because we're going to get to talk about dogs and who doesn't love dogs. For many of us, dogs are an important part of our life, whether they're just a pet or they're a working dog. They just make life better. So I had started training dogs a few years ago, and when I go out in public, I see I see a dog and I look at it through a different lens now. Now, more and more, we see dogs everywhere that we go. They're at the store, doctor's offices, hospitals, and sometimes though we see some things that are kind of cringeworthy. There's a lot of gray area. So for this episode, we're talking with Leslie Horton. Leslie's the owner of Most Fine Canine in Frederick, Maryland, where she has over 20 years of experience helping people with everything from basic obedience to serving as an expert witness. But she specializes in training service dogs for people with disabilities from MS, deafness, and spinal cord and traumatic brain injuries. She graduated from a dog training program and holds multiple certifications, and she belongs to the International Association of Canine Professionals, where she was inducted into their Hall of Fame. She's also served with a U.S. Department of Transportation work group looking at service dogs and ESAs on airlines and the Airline Access Carriers Act. Leslie's an RN and the coordinator of Innova Fairfax Hospital's Animal Assisted Care Program, where she oversees teams of handlers and dogs at their four hospital campus. If all of that didn't make her the perfect guest to tackle this topic, I also want to mention that one of the dogs that she has is a mobility service dog that helps her with her own neurological disabilities. Now, Leslie has experience as a dog trainer, a medical professional, and a patient that gives her incredible insight on a topic that can be pretty confusing and can get people pretty emotional also. It's fantastic having you here. So let's just kind of jump into it. You ready? I'm ready. Thank you for having me. Okay. So first of all, let's start with what is the difference between a service dog and an emotional support dog? A um, couple terms I'm going to just start off correcting. Um, under the ADA, only dogs can be service dogs. And um, there is an exception for miniature horses. Um, but under an emotional support animal, it can be any animal. It does not have to be a dog. So let's, uh, so we're, when we're clarifying definitions, let's include that clarification. Um, so a service dog has to perform a trained task to mitigate the symptoms of a disability. The dog also has to be in such a, a state of behavior that does not interfere with any business's ability to conduct business. Often people think that the, the dog is granted access, but in actuality, the person with the disability has the accommodation to have the dog with them in the business. The second thing is emotional support animals, they're only currently in the United States covered for um, under HUD, under the Federal Housing Act. And they're allowed to be with people who rent. Now, that rental can include university dorms. By their very definition, though, they do not have to be trained because their very presence mitigates the disability. And most of us who have pets at some point or another who have had a bad day come home and we have that moment where we get to relax and be with our pets and we have that calm, they have that calming effect. Right. But these people actually have to have a disability. So, um, and usually it involves a psychiatric disability and the dog provides a calming effect or the animal provides a calming effect. It can be fish. It can be... Um, Cats, it can be anything like that. But in order to get the exception under HUD or under FHA, the person has to let the landlord know that they have a disability and they have to ask for accommodation. So um, you were were talking about it's the person who has the um, accommodation and that the animal a service dog can go places that other animals can't, so to say, but the business still has to be able to conduct their business. Can you, can you go into, is, are there any restrictions on that or? Sure. Think about a zoo. 
Okay. Think about a zoo. There are some areas that a dog could actually be, the presence of the dog could actually be harmful for the animal. Now, that does not mean that service dogs are not permitted in zoos. They are, but there are certain exhibits where it would be inappropriate or harmful to that animal, the other animal, to have the dog present. And um, zoos have the right to limit that access so that they can provide service and share the animals with other people. So that's one. Um, the other thing would be operating rooms. <laughs> people often confuse intensive care units as sterile environments. They're actually not. A sterile environment is uh, one where um, certain uh, procedures occur with less germs available, and that would be the OR. Um, but you can still take your dog to a PACU with you or a, um, a pre-op area, depending on what's going on. So the biggest problem with hospitals and service dogs while we're on that subject is that a lot of people don't realize that if you have a service dog and you come into the hospital, you or your family member or a significant other has to provide care for the dog. The staff does not provide care. So um, that's very important to note because unfortunately, those of us with disabilities can end up in the hospital. So it's real important to know what our, what our guidelines are with our dogs. And in a lot of institutions, uh, people will say, well, can't the volunteer take the dog? No, they cannot because the volunteer then puts himself into a position where they're accepting liability for the behavior of the dog. And we just can't do that. Yeah, that's that's a part of having a service dog that I never would have considered. You know, if if you if you're in the hospital, you know, the dog still has to go out, dog still has to be fed, still has to be cared for properly. That's that's an excellent point. It doesn't mean the dog isn't with you. It just means somebody has to provide that care. So if if, if you're out someplace with your service dog, um, is a business allowed to require documentation, or um, do you have to explain the details of what you need the animal for, or like exactly what do you have to disclose? I had a friend of mine who was blind and she always said she thought it was easier for her to have access than it was for me because her uh, disability was very visual. And mm -hmm. I think that that's true. Um, I find that uh, we tend to have more difficulty when we have invisible disabilities. Um, and the only thing that a business can ask you is, is this a service dog? And what trained task does it provide for you? There are some people who get frustrated because they'll say, well, he does mobility assistance or he does scent detection. That's a type of service dog. That's not a trained task. And if the dog is, most of the time that answer is okay, especially if the dog's well-behaved. But if the dog is not well-behaved, the owner or the manager can say to you, that's a type of service dog. Can you explain to me what the trained tasks are? What they can't do is ask you what your disability is. They shouldn't say to you, you look like you don't need a dog. <laughs> they can't ask for documentation of vaccinations. They cannot ask for um, certification that the dog is a service dog. As a matter of fact, as we all know, most certifications for service dogs are actually um, fraudulent. And they create more of an issue. And that's why the United States Department of Justice doesn't even recognize certifications for service dogs. Yeah, that was one of the, the questions I wanted to, wanted to bring up. You know, I always see, you know, people out in public with their dogs. Um, they have their vests on, you know, certified service dog. And the dogs are, they're barking at people or they're jumping up on people. They're, you know, at the end of the leash trying to get to someone um, and just, in no way focused on the handler, let alone responding to the handler's commands or cues or, or, or things like that. How, what is kind of the proper conduct for a service dog in public? Are there standards of behavior, like expectations? The law is broad, but it does state that the dog could not interfere with the ability to conduct business. So a dog that's going up to other people is interfering with other customers conducting business. If I'm in a grocery store and I'm shopping and a dog's coming up and jumping on me, or even if it's just coming up to me to pet it, that is actually interfering with my ability to get groceries. So the dog shouldn't do that. Obviously the animal should be housebroken. Uh, the dog should have um, 
not should not have uncontrolled vocalization. Okay. So it's unrealistic to think that sometimes a dog might not bark. Um, and let me give you an example. You go to Lowe's and, and you walk by one of the Halloween decorations and, and the, and it, and it's, it's fixed and all of a sudden it moves and your dog might alert. And if it does, the handler has to control it. So if the handler says, uh, no, knock it off. Um, I used to go, Hey, what was that? Let's go see it. <laughs> Cause I want him to be used to those kinds of things. Right. So I love the season because this is when I take dogs out and start socializing them to all of these different sounds. Um, but my point is, is if the dog does vocalize, I have to get the dog under control. If the dog continues to vocalize, then the manager should ask that dog to be removed. Mm-hmm. We're kind of in a double edged sword right now because a lot of people love their dogs And there is a, I'm going to get in trouble for this, but there is a humanizing of our animals. And in that humanizing, people are calling them fur babies and they love them and they want to be with them all the time, but they're not understanding how that affects people with disabilities, nor are they understanding that the behavior of their dogs should be a certain way. And um, the other Uh, dimension of that is businesses, when they do deny, even if they're correct in denying, they're thrown in social media. And so they're kind of like, we're going to get bad press, even if we do the right thing. Yeah. Um, So the states are coming, are finally putting laws on the books, where if you fake a service dog, you can be, it's a misdemeanor, you can be, you, you can be charged. The problem with that is it's really hard to prove. Right. <laughs> so, so um, we have, we also live in a, a world right now that's a little um, self-focused and that's unfortunate too, because I don't think they understand the effects of what they are doing. Um, babying an animal and treating it as a human is really an injustice because it's a different species. And so we need to recognize that these are different species and that some of them have very important work to do. And we need to do our part to allow them to do that work and to really help people with disabilities. And I think that, 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 um, sometimes gets missed because people think it's just their dog or they're the only ones that are making the exception. But in actuality, there's several people who are putting their dog out there when the dog should be home. You were talking about uh, some states are are enacting laws around fake service animals, service dogs. Other countries, do they have like national standards for service dogs? And, And the U.S. is just kind of behind on it or still so new that no one's really kind of caught up in terms of like policy? There are a lot of countries that uh, enforce that the dogs have to adhere to the ADI standards, which is the uh, Assistance Dogs International. The problem with that is there are some things that they have that are, are difficult for everyone to meet. For example, they don't recognize owner trained dogs. Um, you have to be a part of their organization. Um, you have to be nonprofit. They're not in um, every state. Or they're not in every country. So there's a lot of people who would benefit that are not getting that animal. And that's what's nice about the United States Department of Justice is they left it broad, hoping that people who needed the dogs and to have access with the dogs so the dogs could help them become more independent, that that would actually happen. Unfortunately, like I said, um, there are people who don't want to, um, and this is under the Department of Transportation, not under the Department of Justice, but they don't want to pay the pet fee. Pets are expensive. (laughs) Right. You know, so, you know, saying your dog is a service dog because you don't want to pay a fee, you are actually going on record as having stated that you have a disability. And as someone who has a disability, I can tell you that's not always something you want to have to go on record with because it comes with its own uh, burdens and insurance issues and 
I think people need to understand you, there are certain positions you cannot do because you don't, you're not able to meet the essential functions anymore. Right. So I think that those are things that people need to realize that the minute that they state that the dog, that the dog is an emotional support animal or a service dog, um, they have labeled themselves as having a disability. Yeah, that that's interesting. And in- in and of itself, like you talked a little bit before about the stigmatization of having illness, you know, someone with with a, a disability that's very visible, it, it's very easy for people to comprehend and wrap their, their heads around versus someone who has a spine injury and is able to be mobile, but has some of the other problems that go along with that and would require a service dog. It makes it very difficult to blend into a crowd when you have the service dog. It, it definitely does label you and opens you up to not only the stigma, but also one of the things I always teach or always speak to my clients about the people that I'm training their dogs is about how people in the United States and our culture, how they deal with dogs in public. Someone will think nothing of it, of walking 20, 30 feet across uh, across the mall parking lot just to come over and touch your dog without even saying anything to you. And it's like, no, please stay, get back. There's a trend out there where a lot of people are not marking their dogs as service dogs. I, I mark them because, and I put a big stop sign on my vest and people don't read them. um, But at least I can say that stop sign that applies to you. Um, So I definitely think you should identify your dogs as service dogs. Um, Again, I find that not identifying the dog leads to more confusion and more people wanting to take their dogs out. Um, I also think that it's an opportunity for people to understand that service dogs are going to be part of our society. Um, there are We're finding more and more things that the dogs can do. And that there, I think it helps to educate a certain level of behavior. I do think business owners should understand that they can help us by making sure that if they, if the dog is poorly behaved to ask them to leave Um, or to, you know, you have to ask the person to get the dog under control. The person can't get the dog under control, then you have the right to to ask the person to leave. And again, a lot of the businesses don't want to do that, but I actually encourage them to do it. And um, the reason is, is because those dogs that are poorly behaved make it very difficult for people like me who go in with the dog. I can't tell you many people look at me and go, you don't look disabled. And one of my responses back to them is, how would you like me to look to make you more comfortable with the fact that I have a disability? (laughs) Right. It's because a lot of people don't understand. And then it's so funny when you say that to them, the look that they give you. I like to see a light bulb go off because that always helps me to know that I'm educating somebody. (laughs) I guess this is kind of a two-part question and you can answer it in any order, but what is it? What is the process of getting a service dog? And can you tell us a little bit about the training of a service dog? Wow. Um, Let's do the process. The process it depends on which organization you go with and also what your um, disability is. If you have type 1 diabetes and you need a diabetic alert dog, that is a dog that is trained differently. Um, there is then a dog that does mobility assistance or a dog that supports for mental illness. So The point is, is the first thing that I tell anybody who needs a service dog is to research because in every profession, I don't care if you're a teacher, I don't care if you're in healthcare, I don't care if you are in construction, they're really, really good and they're really, really bad. (laughs) And when you're vesting your health and which you are doing when you have a disability and you need a service dog, you need to be asking questions. How many service dogs have you trained? How, how, how many have you placed? What is your success rate? How many are currently working? How do you train a dog? Um, so those are the kinds of things that people need to think about. And I would be doing a disservice if I did not tell everyone, just like every child 
does not grow up to be an astronaut or president of the United States. Not every dog can become a service dog. There's so many people that will be like, I bought this dog, Leslie, I want you to train it as a service dog. And the dog is in no way, shape or form able to be a service dog. Um, a neurotic dog, asking a dog that has a, an innate ability to be a frightened and asking it to go on the DC Metro is not fair. Right. So we need to really make sure that we understand our dogs. Um, the other thing is they need to know the health of the dogs and where these dogs are coming from, because, you know, there's a lot of organizations that are training with rescue dogs. I have no issue with that. I think that's great if the dog has the temperament and they can do it. However, what is the health of these dogs? Because, and are they checking it? Because if the dog if they haven't checked for hip dysplasia, you have to remember that dog is walking on concrete floors. When you think about grocery stores, banks, schools, hospitals, office buildings, um, sidewalks, all of that is concrete. They're hard surfaces. And so if you have a dog that hasn't been checked for um, good structure, the dog can um develop pain, not be able to work for very long. And as any of us who have pain can tell you, sometimes we can get a little grumpy with our chronic pain. So it would only be natural that a dog who cannot tell you I'm having a bad day, I'm in pain, might get grumpy if somebody pushes on its back and it has um, hip dysplasia. So those are things to think about. So um, those are the questions that I would be asking. Um, and the process can be long. Like with some organizations, you fill out an application. And then when you do the application, some will have dogs that they've already trained and they'll pair with you. Some will have dogs that they select specifically for you. I personally like to select dogs, particularly for that person. Okay. And the reason is, is because I deal a lot with mobility and the size of the dog and the size of the person can vary. So when you're dealing with that, the dog, there are certain criteria that the dog has to meet in, in order to be able to um, transfer safely and to do those kinds of things. Um, also, there's a difference between placing a dog with the person who hikes regularly versus somebody who um, works in an office and stays home. And I'm not, I'm not knocking either lifestyle. I'm just saying that one dog would fit in better with a certain lifestyle than the other one. So you have to take that into consideration as well. So those are the kinds of things to think about. I really appreciate, you know, the consideration for the dog's well-being and and being fair to the dog. Like you were saying, you don't want to take a dog like a Malinois and put it into an office environment where it's just doesn't have an outlet to deal with its own emotions and energy requirements, things like that. But looking at the stress that the dog will be under in terms of the working conditions and like and the wear and tear on the dog of the tasks that it's going to be required. I think sometimes when we're talking about service animals and service dogs, we can easily lose focus that they're a living thing and they have emotions and and they're gonna, like you said, they're 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 gonna have some pain and be a little bit grumpy today. We see them as a tool too often and we forget that we really have to be considerate of them and their health also. Correct. I mean I think that people don't um, realize that because they are living creatures, they have good days and bad days too. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I've been doing this for over 20 years. And if you want me to tell you that I've never had a dog go to the bathroom in an inside area, I could tell you that I would be lying, but <laughs> the point of the matter is they get sick. They mm -hmm. can throw up, they can have diarrhea. And the point is how you handle it. Right. When it has happened to me, I have found people to be um, very supportive. But one of the things that I always have with me is a kit. Right. <laughs> I'll go anywhere without a kit to clean up after my dogs. And uh, the one time that you do is the one time. <laughs> <laughs> So I just, you know, I mean, there's a, there's accountability and responsibility that comes with being a handler too. And if your dog was sick that morning and no matter what you wanted to do, you might need to have the dog be home. And sometimes people don't realize that either. I mean, right. 
some of the guide dog organizations make sure that a person can get around without a dog before they'll place a dog. And the reason is, is because you have to consider that you're a team and right. sometimes a team member can have an off day or and need to stay home. Um, if your dog has an injury, you know, you're out playing ball with them and he, hurts himself. You don't want to work in the next day. So right. those are the kinds of things that people need to think about that they often do not. Yeah. The yeah. other thing that I find is a lot of people expect the dogs to come with remote control. <laughs> when I say sit, that dog better sit. When I say down, that dog better down. And when I say do this, that dog better do that. That's not a realistic expectation either, because right. they're going to have days where you might have to say sit twice. Right. Or, you know, I have a friend who tells a story about a dog that wouldn't move forward. And she's, again, I, I think I mentioned her before, she was blind and she, the dog wouldn't go forward. And she's like, what is wrong with this dog? And here the dog was preventing her from walking into a ditch. Uh -huh. So the dog knew better and she didn't. So, you know, dogs, service dogs also have to have civil disobedience. They have right. to be able to tell you no. Um, or they have to not obey a command. And so that's important to remember when you're picking out a trainer too, because if you have a trainer that says, when I tell my dog to jump, he has to jump so high, he should be asking me how high to jump. That's concerning because a, a service dog trainer needs to understand that there are times the dog is going to disobey and it's actually going to help you. Right. So I think people need to realize that as well. Um, they don't come with remote control. They're living creatures. Um, so you work as a team. And as any good relationship is, you have to be able to communicate between the two of you. And the better the communication, the smoother the relationship. So as for how to train a service dog, um, a lot of people talk about socialization, but they don't understand the term socialization. Right. For a yes. lot of people, they think socializing a dog is getting it out and running around and playing with other dogs and and um, doing all those kinds of things. Well, in actuality, I have a bird and I have a bunny and they get to run around the house and the dogs have to leave them alone <laughs> because that's part of their socialization is they can't be chasing squirrels when they're working. Um, they have to be able to go downtown and have the brakes on a bus decompress and make that sound and be okay. Um, there are times I'll be like, hey, I see you have a motorcycle. Can you introduce my dog to your motorcycle? Are you comfortable starting the motorcycle next to my dog? Oh, I see you have skateboards. Can you skateboard next to my dogs? Um, I go up to police officers in uniform. Hey, can you say hi to my dog? Because I wanted to get used to seeing the jackets and seeing the gear and, and all those kinds of things. Oh, you have a segue. Can my dog see your segue? <laughs> so, I mean, it's really funny because most people do really want to help you. Sometimes you run into people who are a little uncomfortable, they're afraid, and that's a different thing. But I remember one gentleman, he had a motorcycle, and I was like, hey, can I introduce this dog to your motorcycle? He was a little nervous when you pulled up. And are you willing to do that? And I, I chuckled because the guy was so sweet. He was like, these are the handlebars. <laughs> but this is the seat. And this is how we turn the motorcycle on. And you know what? I'm going to turn the motorcycle on, but I'm going to just show you first. I mean, he was so sweet. And I just let him do what he wanted to do. And next thing I know, he's got the little pup up on the motorcycle with him and he's going to start the bike. And I'm like, go for it. And they were <laughs> fine. And the dog was, it worked. The dog did right. fine after that with motorcycles. So I think that those are the kinds of things that is actual socialization. And, you know, um, people avoid crowds, but sometimes you need to put the dog in a crowd. Now, granted, you don't take a dog for the very first time and throw them in a crowd. Um, but they should also be doing public transportation because there's very few of us who have never been on a bus uh, or a people mover or a metro at one time or another, something that we've had to use. So the dogs have to be comfortable getting on and off those things and being safe. Elevators, uh, floors with um, I call them invisible walls. You know, they have like the glass walls mm -hmm. and the, the, the elevations there. And you take the dog next to the, the 
um, window and they're like, hey, no way I'm going over there. <laughs> so you have to teach them that it's safe and that they're going to be comfortable. And those are all part of the things that we should be socializing dogs for. It's not just about going up to people and um, being able to play with dogs. It's right. so much more. Um, kids running by screaming, um, love to go to the playground and just sit my dogs there. Um, I also use playgrounds to socialize my dogs. The uh, suspension bridges are great to get the dog used to having an unsteady background. So that is socialization. And so that's very important in any service dog, that the dog is comfortable in those different types of environments. The last thing I socialize on any of my service dogs is every service dog that I train has to fly with me because I have to laugh because there's all these people go, well, we take the dog to the airport and we have the dog, uh, the airline lets us on and we have the dog sit on the airline and it's all good. But you have no way of knowing how that dog is going to do until you do take off. <laughs> You're in the air and you do landing. And um, so I will let the airline know, hey, this is the first time this dog is flying. I do have a disability, need to make sure this dog is safe. And the airlines that I work with, they tend to be very kind to me. And I'm fortunate because I live near Baltimore. So I get on a plane at BWI and I go to either Columbus or Pittsburgh for an hour. <laughs> I go eat lunch and I get right back on the plane and I fly back. It's done in a day. Um, but it's a really good experience for the dogs to actually go through the airport to see what it's like and um, to go through TSA. And you should be practicing TSA before you ever get there. Again, there's very few of us who at one time or another, we may need to, uh, an airplane trip. And so if we do, we need to make sure that our dogs are able to do that with us. And too many people put their dogs on these airlines and the behavior is atrocious. The dogs are barking. The dogs are doing this. Um, I will say that every time I travel, I do work with my veterinarian in case the dog isn't able to travel, that I can, um, medicate <laughs> to help it get through. Um, Fortunately, um, I only had one dog that was like really awful on a plane and the airline was kind with me. Uh, they were very gentle. Um, but, um, and I worked really hard to, to get that dog under control. Mm. So I think that people need to understand no matter how well trained a dog is, you have no way of knowing what they're going to do. So that's something that I think should be part of service dog training and the socialization. Then, of course, you can have all that done, but the dog has to perform a trained task. So if you have a seizure disorder and your dog is letting you know that you're having a seizure, but you haven't trained it or shaped that behavior, that dog is technically not a service dog. The dog has to be trained to recognize, to see it and respond consistently the same way and then perform the task. So um, the other part of training service dogs is the performance of those trained tasks. Well, I'm trying to wrap my head around of all of the the time and the processing that has to go through and just getting finding the 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 right dog who can handle the work in terms of their own health, um, that has the temperament and the ability to be under stress and work through it productively and still continue on and be able to do their job. Well, part of that is also relationship training, but you do check it when you temperament test. Right. Like I temperament test my litter. So I, before I buy or purchase a dog, I, and I do things like put them on a small teeter totter. I put them in a little, um, I forget what it's called. It's a little dome thing that shakes. And mm -hmm. I want to see how they do. I want to see if they have a, a retrieve. I want to see if they have ball drive. I don't want the dog that's taking the toy from me and uh, shredding it and taking off from me. I want the dog who wants to pick up the toy and is okay with me with them because, you know, one, one might make a really good police dog. Right. But the dog that makes a really good police dog may not make a really good service dog. So, and um, 
you don't want the dog that's in the back in the corner, but you don't want the dog that is necessarily the crazy one either. You want kind of the dog, like you pop up an umbrella. How does the dog do around an umbrella? Um, if you cover their head with a towel, how do they do? Do right. they cry? Do they freak? And what, what do they do when you change the surfaces that they walk on? So you can kind of test. Even at that, you're only getting what that dog was that particular day. Mm -hmm. Um, but you can stack the deck in your favor. And so does the breeder have, and do these, have these parents thrown service dogs already? Um, does the breeder have a really good reputation? Is the health testing done? Um, I have used rescue dogs. So I have one that, uh, was, uh, came from somebody else, but the dog, the first thing I did when I got him was I had him x-rayed. Are his hips and elbows good enough to do the job? And um, he's going to be a great service dog. Um, but I usually tend to buy from breeders who have produced service dogs and they do the required genetic testing and the health testing. And so you're paying a lot of money for your dog coming out of the gate. When you pay for a well-bred dog, you're paying. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's not 300. <laughs> Right, right. You're, you're paying. <laughs> right. We've covered so much, and this has been fantastic. I know I've learned a lot, and I'm sure the people who are listening, um, it, it, this is really going to be helpful for them because there is so much information out there, and a lot of it is not good. So I appreciate you taking the time to sit down with us and go through all of this. It's been awesome. Where can people find more about you and, and what you do in your work? Uh, Mostfinecanine.net uh, is my uh, webpage and that's always a good place to start. I also run therapy dog program, the animal assisted care program at Innova. Um, so people can find me running around there. <laughs> so any questions that people have, I'm, um, pretty uh, good about answering and, um, I might not get to you right that moment, but I'll get to you within a day or two. Wonderful. Again, thank you very much, and I appreciate your time spending it with us. Thank you for having me.